Year's Eve. Bread for a treat as we celebrate Juneteenth. You know, it's no small coincidence, because I don't believe in coincidence, I believe in providence. It's no small coincidence that we are here today. Chave University is the first HBCU in America. And along with our partner, Lincoln University, the first degree-granting university in America, we're part of history. Formed in 1837, prior to the Civil War, prior to the Emancipation Proclamation, etc. And this is the place where Africans began to get an education because they had been left out of Main Street. We're now several hundred years later, or 184 for us here in Chaney, and we're still on our quest to educate African Americans and people of color because the job is not done. It's important that we are here to celebrate Juneteenth because celebrations are extremely important for all of us. It's a time for us to reflect, but it's also a time for us to project. We're going to project the future because we are part of it, and we are here to make history. So tonight, as you sit and you listen to what is going to be presented to you tonight, I welcome you to enjoy yourself, and we thank you for coming to Chase University and making this a stop on your journey. Enjoy the evening, and it's now my pleasure to introduce Greg Thompson, the Executive Director of Voices Underground. Give them a hand. The work of Voices Underground is to listen to those voices, voices that have often been ignored, to listen to those voices, to be changed by those voices, and to amplify those voices uh, throughout this community and throughout the country. And so we embark, we're joining with our partners at Chain. Thank you so much for your hospitality uh, to all of us tonight. Uh, to listen to those voices and to be changed by them. Now, as a part of this work, uh, we collaborate with partners all over Chester County to say, how could we amplify and these voices? And the idea was to promote a countywide Juneteenth festival. Um, and so we joined with all of our sponsors and all of our partners to create this festival, to celebrate Juneteenth, to commemorate Juneteenth and all of its complexity. Uh, a day that is both celebrates freedom and also acknowledges freedom delayed. And so we're here to acknowledge that together, to remember that, to honor that together. Now, I, I want to thank our partners. I want to thank Chain University. I want to thank the board of Voices Underground, uh, Mike Bontrager from Square Roots Collective, uh, President Brenda Allen from Lincoln University, and Marnie Conley from Longwood Gardens. And I want to thank all of our financial partners who have joined us in this time. Now, Juneteenth, as I said, uh, it, it marked a shift in the American racial imagination a shift from enslavement to freedom. But because it happened two and a half years after the Emancipation Proclamation, it also indicated that that shift had not yet fully come in, in parts of America. Indeed, it has not fully come today. That there's this idea of renewing the imagination, the American racial imagination, and healing that is an ongoing process. And tonight, that's what we're here to do. We're here to consider what does it mean to us together to labor toward the healing of the American racial imagination. Now, how are we going to do that? We're going to do that through poetry, through art, through lecture, through discussion. These are all the things that we're giving ourselves to tonight. And our first step on this program is I Matter. All these marvelous folks up here, maybe feel old, uh, are up here on the stage, um, and they're going to perform tonight. Now, under the leadership of Isabella Hansen, the I Matter initiative, it's a, it's a youth movement in the national conversation around social justice and racial equity. Um, and we invited uh, Isabella here uh, after hearing her marvelous work last year uh, for Juneteenth of 2020 in incredible ways. And so now to introduce the I Matter, I'd like to invite hip hop trailblazer and legend Roxanne Shante to come and, and, and lead us in this part of the program. Thank you. I had the pleasure of meeting this young lady and actually watching her grow. Watching her go and do all these different, successful, wonderful, beautiful projects. Never were any of these projects ever selfish or for herself. She's always done these things to make sure that she's done things to better the community. She surprised us as adults. She has been a leader for us all. When you look at her, the first thing you think about is she's an inspiration and how she's willing to go out and do things and show such um, 
and I've told her about this before, it's called healthy selfishness when it comes to being able to take those inner things inside of you and want to give. She gives and she gives and she gives and she gives. So it's an honor for me to know that in 2020, at the age of 14, Isabella Hansen was inspired to launch a national poetry competition on why Black Lives Matter, powered by Gucci. Isabella's I Matter Poetry Contest drew students' participation in 26 states. The top poems and art were made into a compilation book honoring the lives of black people killed in 2020. This project followed her 2020 Juneteenth celebration, which she hosted to bring racial healing to the community at the historic Fossil House, a site that helped lead over 2,000 slaves to freedom. Isabella is an honor roll student, a Kent High School in Pennsylvania. She holds a leadership role in her school's diversity club and model United Nations is a youth founder of the National Youth Foundation. She's a member of her school's track team and humanitarian club. In other words, Isabella does it all. <laughs> and she does it well. So I am pleased to welcome to you now and present to you now, Isabella Hansen. Before I tell you a bit about my matter, I have to take a moment to tell you about our amazing. Can you hear me? Pick up the mic. All right, I'll pick it up. Pick up the one on your right. Yeah. He's the one on the stand. Right. Okay. Yeah, All right, I'll pick up this one. Can you guys hear me now? Woo! <laughs> And um, before I tell you a bit about my matter, I have to take a moment to tell you about our amazing MC, Roxanne Shantek. She was the first female superstar of hip hop, and when her first hit, Roxanne's Revenge, dropped in 1984, the whole world became aware that women rap artists existed. I had the honor of meeting this icon when I was working on a book project with students in Philadelphia about Lady B. I grew up listening to quotes from her songs from my mother, who likes to answer questions and lines from songs and movies. That was actually how I heard about Lola Fulon. In 2018, her film, Roxanne Roxanne, was released starring Oscar winner Mahershala Ali is her boyfriend, and Nia Long is her mother. Today you can hear her powerful voice on LL Cool J's Rock the Bell Station on Sirius XM, which my dad listens to every time, like every chance he gets. <laughs> and I would also like, I would like to welcome Sophia Hansen, the co-founder of the National Youth Foundation to the stage, and I would also like to bring Roxanne back. And I would like to ask everyone to stand so we can honor her remarkable contribution to life. This year, the contest deadline is July 23rd, so please tell any of you in your network. 
But if there's any feedback here, just um, if you look at National Aid Foundation on Google, you're going to be on that page and then to there. And so far this year, we have 380 submissions from 41 states and 12 countries. I please. provide a positive forum for you to use art to express how they felt about watching an officer kneel on George Floyd's neck for eight minutes and 46 seconds. I took my pain and launched my initiatives using the, the tools of hope and prayer. So to the youth present here today, I say that with heart and determination, anything is possible. Now without further ado, we will hear from some of our amazing 2020 winners. Thank you. Watch the world become undone. 
tumble to pieces because there is no communication. It would be nice to say that we will hold on to our patience, but for how long? We must acknowledge that people are wrong. When will, when will the world include everyone? When will everyone fail when they belong? But it's a silence that feels so sweet, it makes mothers weep, for now their house of three is down to two, because police thought he fit the description, but that's nothing new. I think and wonder, what can I do? So many people protesting, yet I'm sitting watching TV. What can I do? I can remember that my voice has power, power that I can use to educate others around me. Why is being black seen as a crime? Leaves our black brother, leaves our black brothers wondering, is it their time? As soon as we fight, your skin is boiling, stumbling over your words because my words are roaring. All that pain and anger probably got carried away, but I will stand up for what's right any day. Don't judge a book by its cover, they say. There's no action in these words, so it remains just a phrase. We walk around being black, and the world automatically wants to judge us. We have been fighting the same fight, yet no justice. You can be whatever you want when you grow up, they say. There's no action in these words, or remains just a phrase. I'm only hired because the job needs because the job needs diversity. You need more blacks in the community. But they fire me because I'm the best on the, on the job. Scared that I will rise and take all the power that I will now be on top. Our pain has turned to anger, so powerful to shift the nation. We are fed up with this injustice and we are done being patient. Our voices will be heard, whether others like it or not. This is a free country and we deserve our spot.
When she is not working on a writing assignment, she is busy playing Roblox and enjoying them with her cats, Midnight and Simone. She is a level eight gymnast who hopes to compete in the 2028 Olympics in Los Angeles, California. Please put your hands together. Cage 
and set ourselves free. Thank you.
to the mic to share a poem from the 2020 I Matter contest called Hey Google.
canonical question of the black church. I mean, blue church. I mean, the soul church. I mean, the secularly sacred, capital B, capital C, church of what's good, what delivers you to heaven or what delivers you on earth. Can I get a witness? When you're an artist, the question shifts slightly. The question becomes, can I be a witness? Can I describe this? For a writer, it's exactly like the Russian woman asked. Can I tell it so that it rings right to the others who've lived it? Can I offer that precious relief that comes with feeling seen and not alone? I'm here in large part, I think, because of an essay I wrote last summer, right around this time. It was an act of witnessing that found an audience. Everything I do these days, really, is just some kind of call and response. The world is crying out, and my report was my response. Then my words became a call, and I continue to be moved by the voices that have returned to be, returned to me, moved by what I wrote. In the spirit of continuing that practice, that tradition, our traditional practice, on this day, I'm going to share that piece with you now. You want a Confederate monument? My body is a Confederate monument. I have great colored skin. My light brown blackness is a living testament to the rules, the practices, the causes of the Old South. If there are those who want to remember the legacy of the Confederacy, if they want monuments, well then, my body is a monument. My skin is a monument. Dead Confederates are honored all over this country with cartoonish private statues, solemn public monuments, and even in the names of United States Army bases. It fortifies and heartens me to witness protests against this practice and the growing, the growing clamor from serious nonpartisan public servants to regret dressing. But there is a difference between rewriting and reframing the past. I say it is not a matter of airbrushing history, but of adding a new perspective. I am a black Southern woman, and of my immediate white male ancestors, all of them were rapists. My very existence is a relic of slavery and Jim Crow. According to the rule of hyperdescent, which is the social and legal practice of assigning a genetically mixed race person to the race with less social power, I am the daughter of two black people, the granddaughter of four black people, the great granddaughter of eight black people. Go back one more generation, and it gets less straightforward and more sinister. As far as family history has always told, and modern DNA testing has allowed me to confirm, I am the descendant of black women who were domestic servants and white men who raped their help. It is an extraordinary truth of my life that I am biologically more than half white, and yet I have no white people in my genealogy and living memory. No voluntary whiteness. I am more than half white, and none of it was consensual. White Southern men, my ancestors, took what they wanted from women they did not love, over whom they had extraordinary power, and then failed to claim their children. What is a monument but a standing memory, an artifact to make tangible the truth of the past? My body and blood are a tangible truth of the South and its past. The black people I come from were owned by the white people I come from. The white people I come from fought and died for their lost cause. And I ask you now, <coughs> who dares to tell me to celebrate them? Who dares to ask me to accept their mounted pedestals? 
You cannot dismiss me as someone who doesn't understand. You cannot say it wasn't my family members who fought and died. My blackness does not put me on the other side of anything. It puts me squarely at the heart of the debate. I don't just come from the South. I come from the Confederates. I've got rebel gray blue blood coursing my veins. My great-grandfather Will was raised with the knowledge that Edmund Pettus was his father. Pettus, the storied Confederate general, the grand dragon of the Ku Klux Klan, the man for whom Selma's bloody Sunday bridge was named. So I'm not an outsider who makes these demands. I'm a great, great granddaughter. And here I'm called to say there is much about the South that is precious to me. I do my best teaching and writing here. There is, however, a peculiar model of Southern pride that must now, at long last, be reckoned with. This is not an ignorant pride, but a defiant one. It is a pride that says, our history is rich, our causes are justified, our ancestors lie beyond reproach. It's a pining for greatness, if you will. A wish again for a certain kind of American memory, a monument-worthy memory. But here's the thing. Our ancestors don't deserve your unconditional pride. Yes, I am proud of every one of my black ancestors who survived slavery. They earned that pride by any decent person's reckoning. But I'm not proud of the white ancestors whom I know by virtue of my very existence to be bad actors. Among the apologists for the Southern cause and for its monuments, there are those who dismiss the hardships of the past. They imagine a world of benevolent masters and speak with misty eyes of gentility and honor and the land. They deny plantation rape or explain it away or question the degree of frequency with which it occurred. To those people, it is my privilege to say, I am proof. I am proof that whatever else the South might have been or might believe itself to be, it was and is a space whose prosperity and sense of romance and nostalgia were built upon the grievous exploitation of black life. And I should say, really, this country, actually. The dream version of the old South never existed. Any manufactured monument to that time in that place tells half a truth at best. The ideas and ideals it purports to honor are not real. To those who have embraced these delusions, now is the time to re-examine their position. Either you have been blind to a truth that my body's story forces you to see, or you really do mean to honor the oppressor at the expense of the oppressed. And you must at last acknowledge your emotional investment in the legacy of hate. Either way, I say the monuments of stone and metal, the monuments of cloth and wood, all man-made monuments must come down. I defy any sentimental southerner to defend our ancestors to me. I'm quite literally made of reasons to strip them of their laurels. It is a privilege of my life that I get to be part of these conversations in this moment in history. I am here with you. We are gathered here together for the first moment we all get to celebrate Juneteenth as the federally sanctioned holiday it always should have been. And, I've, and as I've contemplated this day, what I've grappled with most is the question of how to make the most of good news when it comes, even if it's late. Enslaved people across the American South had been legally freed by the Emancipation Proclamation in 1862. Slavery became illegal in all of the United States 
in January of 1865. The Civil War ended in early May of that same year, and yet the news of freedom did not formally come to Texas until June 19, 1865. They were free and didn't know. And there is a bitterness that comes when you ration the truth. There is a bitterness that comes when you ration the truth. As a woman who's authored a cookbook, I'm invested in serving up full helpings. As a black southern home cook, I know something about taking a bitter or too hard thing and making it nourishing and rich. <coughs> Lemon pie, collard greens. As a black American southern home cooking woman, writing woman, I'm something, of, something obsessed with the past. I spend a lot of my life certainly my writing life, working to reframe things. Not rewrite them, but revisit them that we might understand them better. It's the work of re-remembering. And again, not redefining, but expanding definitions. Open any decent dictionary, and most of the best words have more than one meaning. Just think. It's wild the way the word share and its verb form means both to divide and to tell. To give something away to or for someone else. And to share your peace. There are so many ways to share the truth. To that end, I'm going to orient this conversation the best way I know how. By telling a story I witnessed in order to get at the bigger picture of the truth. I lived in Mississippi for five of the best and most complicated years of my life. After George Floyd's murder, I'd been thinking a lot about Emmett Till, and I sat down to write this. Mississippi may be the only place on earth I don't feel gaslit when I talk about the trouble with the idea of America, the divide between the reality of it and the dream of it. Because down in Mississippi, it's as plain as the train tracks that still divide one half of any Delta town from another. The student bodies of any white flight academy from their defunded public counterparts. Mississippi is the only place a white person has called me a nigger to my face without fear of trep or trepidation. Not out of a speeding car, which has happened in other places, but in shared space and neither of us planning to leave the room before or after the exchange. Mississippi is the reason that that man brandishing the Confederate battle flag in the Capitol on January 6th was not actually any kind of history maker. I refuse to dignify him with that superlative for many reasons, but beyond anything else, the Magnolia State made sure that fraught battle flag flew every day in the Capitol till they finally did the right thing and wiped that flag off of their flag this past November. Name the best part of Mississippi, the Delta. It means change. Mississippi filled me with wonder because it's the best and worst of this country all the time. And there's no way to hide from either side of it. The terrible systemic inequities, the ridiculous weather, the living things that will consume the house from under you, the relative lawlessness, that means any back road is a chaos highway for good or ill. And here's my favorite touch. In Mississippi, so much of the human rot, best parts, the music, the food, the good history, the hard work, the cadences, and the triumphant transcendence from trauma, well, that's all very black, isn't it? And God help me, I love it for that, too. Here's another truth. I think about Emmett Till every day. That's been true for over a decade. I should say here that I think about George Floyd every day now too, and I have for over a year. But for me, this work, or at least my work, my witnessing, it starts with Emmett Till. On August 24th, 1955, Emmett Till walked into Bryant's grocery store 
and had an exchange with a woman named Carolyn. That conversation would ultimately end his life. 32 years later, to the day, August 24th, 1987, I was born. 32 years to the day. I still can't get over that somehow. And the words I've got to say next, collective memory, anniversaries, epigenetics, inherited trauma, the way the land holds hard stories like DNA does. What was the world remembering? What were black mothers remembering? What size was the South heaving in memorial and grief on the day I landed here? Let me tell it another way. I don't know how to feel like I deserve to be here. What I mean to say is, I don't know how to share my story alongside Emma Till's. I guess I know that the point has got to be the bearing of witness. I'm trying to be a credible messenger. I lived at 514 Grand Boulevard in Greenwood, Mississippi for two years, straight out of college. So I took a right out my driveway and carried on down the boulevard to look across the little bridge over the Tallahatchie River. It turned into one of those classic Delta highways that always seemed to me to be some bright lit, vacant intersection of life and death all the time. Keep driving, and you'll pass the Tallahatchie Flats, a social space with the decorative shacks and curated antique clouds, grim reminders of how cheerfully erasure is undertaken in the name of Southern hospitality. But that's not the story I'm here to tell tonight. The story I'm here to tell tonight is about the first time I kept driving on that highway till it turned into Money Road. I was 22. I was full of fear and wonder at my new home, and I still had something of the voyeur adventurer about me. Cotton, how wild. Endless corn, how wild. Beans, more cotton, wild again, look at this place. And then I got to a stretch of road by the tracks that looked, well, it looked like something out of a deep south, don't know better whimsy. I was thinking of the Kathy Bates parts of fried green tomatoes. A stretch of road that used to be a place where lives were lived. I've always been called to what's haunted. But this wasn't a familiar strain. I parked and got out of the car. I'd seen some ancient thing, some vine-covered relic that touched the romantic parts of my mind. I got out to look, thinking of Iggy and Ruth and other silly white revisionist shit that years of living in the Delta would free me from. I got out and I watched closer and I saw the remains of Bryant's grocery store. Now you must remember, I was standing on the far end, turned right out of my driveway and just kept driving. I was living on the far end of the same street where I paid white people to live. I took a couple steps back and threw up where I stood. Then I got in my car and I never drove back there. A couple of months later, I spent August 24, 2010, waking and sleeping on the same street as Bryant's grocery store, the same street where Emmett Till spent his last days as an unmarked boy, on the same street where he became a marked man. I still don't know what words are enough to honor him and his legacy. Honor Mamie Till and her broken heart. Honor simply a boy who ought to have lived. In the South, we know that places have memories. We know that the land is a soulful thing. I think that struck me, what struck me most about Brian's grocery store was that there was no marker. Every day I drove to teach school from 2010 to 2012, Sunflower County, Mississippi. I drove down Emmett Till Memorial Highway. No context, no explanation, no acknowledgement of the crazy making, terrible, bloody legacy of how that stretch of pavement got its name, but at least there was a sign. Yet there in money at Brian's grocery store, no warning, nothing. No dignifying of the ground. No moment of claiming the shame. No justice. It was a slinking, cowardly shame. 
who, that runs and lies about what it's done. Not the owning, productive shame that drags itself into the light and seeks to begin anew. It was on those drives up and down and the Columbia Highway, that harrowing stretch of road, that Anna Ahmadova's words from Requiem, those beginning words I mentioned, they came back to me. That's why I'm a writer now. I first read them during my senior spring of college, at that time only a year out. I was a school teacher and I was trying to figure out what I was going to do next. I saw that sign every day. I saw those endless fields every day, corn, cotton, catfish, soy. I lived alongside my students every day and the white people who couldn't understand me every day. And I heard the call, can you describe this? And I thought, yes, I can. And the thing I understood next was that if I could, I must. I'm writing and thinking and speaking louder and more regularly than I ever have in my life because I think people need to know and see how this looks in real time. I've lived so much in white spaces, in this black body, and I think it's time to talk more about what I've learned from figuring out how to survive it the degree that I have. Not just about myself, but about a certain kinds of American blind spots. And ultimately, how we might better give and receive necessary tough love. What if I invited you to look at time differently? What if I said that there is the same amount of time between the bellies of middle passage boats and German death camps? as there is between German death camps and whatever Cold War Jim Crow hybrid is percolating in this country here today. 79 years from when the last illegal slave boat docked in Alabama to when Hitler declared war on Poland. 79 years from when the United States joined World War II to the moment we're in right now. Objects and histories mirror are closer than they appear. My great-grandmother, Alberta, lived till I was 16, and we were very close. Her father was a white man who raped her mother while she worked in his home. As a result of the trauma from that assault, Alberta was primarily raised by her grandmother, who'd been born a slave on that same land. So I was loved and molded by a woman, who was loved and molded by a woman born into slavery. Objects in history's mirror are closer than they appear. When people don't want to teach critical race theory, it's a failure of moral imagination. They can't see a way to acknowledge the truth of the past and love the place that allowed that truth to be. Their love is weaker than my love. I know this place. We know this place. We see it what it is, and we love it still. That's backbone love. That's fortitude. Now, I can't talk about that kind of love without, uh, without introducing you to my grandfather, Avon Williams, Jr. He was the first black man to be elected to the Senate, Tennessee Senate since Reconstruction. He was Thurgood Marshall's first cousin. He was a civil rights attorney, a World War II veteran, and a good and loving man. In 1964, he was interviewed at length by Robert Penn Warren for his Who Speaks for the Negro Project. He knew some things about history and memory, the space between wars, and how we talk about love. And he told Warren so. Warren asked him, did the war experience, as it did to so many other people, have some effect on you in your attitude toward the civil rights situation? Was it fixed beforehand, or did, you become, did it become fixed afterward in developing part of your convictions and career? <coughs> to which my grandfather replied, I would say that anyone born in the South, reared in the South, would have any Negro with any powers of perception at all would have to have some rather fixed attitudes long before the age that I went into the Army, which was 21 years of age. I would say, however, that some of my attitudes were intensified by reason of the experience in the Army, 
in a segregated army, and in, the, in some instances in places where the discrimination was just rather open and vicious. Yes, I would say service in the armed forces did intensify some of the attitudes I already had developed as a result of my experience in, as a subnet. Then the interview gets reloaded. Part of the fear of desegregation, of integration, more in positive. Just insert critical race theory here. <laughs> Part of the fear of desegregation, more in positive, was that it was hard to believe that black Americans could really love people who just days, months, years, generations before been willing to engage in a system that stripped them of their rights, dignities, and humanity. And it is a tall order, the notion of choosing to share space with those who have harmed you, or looked away while you were being harmed, or even devoted to someone who was willing to see you wrong done by. My grandfather had an interesting response to that question. He said, I really didn't say what I should have said about this matter of loving those who hate me. I think that many of us misconceive what loving those who can hate you means. Loving. Love does not mean what the white man has traditionally thought it meant. It does not mean being blind to faults. It does not mean being afraid to tell him that he is wrong or when he's being stupid. It does not mean being afraid to fight him in a legitimate way. The love that I'm talking about is the type of love which a very intelligent Christian has for a child. After all, as I see it, although the white man has accused the Negro of being a child in American society, I think that if you look at it realistically, you will find that the white American has displayed the more childish tendencies. That it is he who has failed to accept the responsibilities of a more mature man. Take, for instance, his violation of the Negro slave woman, a completely unrestrained and childish impulse that completely ignored the mature recognition of the facts of life or any insights into the future. The Negro woman, on the other hand, I think, although she was unable to help herself, I think history teaches that she has come off far better in terms of demonstrating maturity, a recognition of the responsibilities of life to herself and to her children. The fact that we have so many Negro men now who have gone so far in life is the result of some Negro mother washing and ironing and working hard to get that child into school and to gain an advantage for him. So I say that love involves chastisement. And I think that the white American needs a whole lot of chastisement. It involves other forms of correction. It involves making an individual receptive whether he wants to or not. It involves a whole lot of things that we don't think about when we talk about love. Love involves chastisement. Let's not avoid. Let's navigate. We are dynamic people. We can stand for two things to be true at once. My grandfather returned to the Army and remained a reservist until retiring as a lieutenant colonel. He could say those things about his experience and still return to the institution where he experienced them. Not because he thought it was perfect or even operationally just, but because he believed in the idea and he believed in the virtues of the fundamental human condition and he believed in the capacity for change. I love the promise of America. I love the idea of a place that is free and equal, but we are not there yet. I'm writing and thinking and speaking now because after the events at the end of last May, I had to do something. I couldn't march because I had asthma and I was afraid of my own ability to breathe. Because I couldn't spend another day wondering, is my whole life going to be defined and framed by old American limitations. Not if I can be a faithful witness, a witness with a loving backbone. 
Another new obsession of mine which I mentioned earlier, epigenetics. The following is a little passage from a piece by Martha Henry Gay writing for the BBC. Researchers were navigating, were investigating a much more obscure type of inheritance. How events in someone's lifetime can change the way their DNA is expressed, and how that change can be passed on to the next generation. This is the process of epigenetics, where the readability or expression of genes is modified without changing the DNA code itself. Tonight, I'm going to get vulnerable and wonder right in front of all of you. Did that bent double moment in Money, Mississippi write itself on my grandchildren's bodies? The way the Middle Passage and chattel slavery and Jim Crow wrote themselves on mine. Trauma changes the blood. But if I'm honest, it's part of why I'm so proud of my blood. I have a kind of moral certainty that comes from knowing all I have to do to live in the light is tell the whole truth of who made me and what makes me. My body's story is its own act of witnessing. Now, if you'll indulge me for a moment before I share some proper poems, I'd like to share with you a working prose poem, something that will likely become my own instead of the preface that I ever sell this book I'm working on. When I wrote that my body was a monument, that was only the beginning of the thought. The body does so much work past the work, so much telling past the shape of the thing. My body has been a bent note, a sound made for the blues. My body has been a sharp knife made for fear and polish and blood and good state. She is also a whole book, an artifact, a mirror, an instrument, a weapon, a frame, a window, a pipe, a funnel, an altar, a vehicle, a platonic ideal, and a veil, and a cave, and a capo, and all six guitar strings together. What if I told you that everybody is a living document? A text to be read by the world. A text you write on, revise, reread, redress, a text that the world reads and misreads, handles and mishandles. So yeah, the body. She's a monument. She's a document. She's a declaration of freedom or peace or war. What else? It's easy to imagine the body a weapon. But what kind of weapon am I? Is a bridge a finished weapon too? A resource? An asset? A tool? Am I a bridge? I've been one before. But am I one still? Do you stay all the things you've been once you've been them? Do we stay all the things we've been once we've been them? Is my body now a weapon because of its story in my pen? Are my words, do I want them to be? I think I do. Here, let me show you. What's my time like? Can I ask? 10 minutes? Okay, cool. I'm going to read a couple poems. So this is a poem that gets a little personal, uh, but I think it's important part of sharing perspective in this time, in this space. Um, about reframing or redressing certain kinds of male, white, white male gazes. This poem is called Other Ways to Say Black Face. It was published in The Atlantic a few months. Take the court, he said. We were out walking. It made me feel free, he said. I stopped walking, I said, I'm sorry. I beg your pardon, take the court. Do you mean black folks? Yes, that's right, he said. It's natural to want to be different, to want to feel free. Oh, 
the white boy. Oh, Lord. Oh, tell me, sir. Yes, tell me how you want to feel free. Oh, boy, here on my street, tell me, do I make you free? Am I your new black face? I mean, my black face next to yours. My black mouth on your mouth, does that free you from your trim white body like that girl do? Am I just your little thick black sweet corkscrew? You know how it works, he said. After your parents have opened the bottle of wine, take one and burn the bottle. Take one, I said. One what? I said. Oh, the cork, I said. Oh, right. Oh, white boy. Oh, Lord. Oh, the street fell away. I'd let you put your hand on my body in both of our wanting. And now you say blackface. And you say free. And you say natural. And you look at me and you say free again. And burn the bottle. And before I could conjure your young white hands with a match burn cork, smudging your face till it feels black and free, I'm afraid of how much you don't know. And I'm afraid of how much I know I can stand. Oh, boy. Oh, oh, take your cork, put it back in the bottle, stuff up everything left of that strange nostalgia. Stop looking to feel free in my skin. Give it back to me. Without the burn, without the cork, my skin looks to you like the freedom your skin is. Poem. It's published in Lit Hub a little bit ago. Um, and I read it tonight for all of the youth that are here uh, and for Emmett Till and for George Floyd. This poem's called Which Lives Matter. They found the shooter and arrested him without incident. They found the shooter and arrested him without incident. They found the shooter and arrested him. Without incident, they found the shooter and arrested him. Without incident, they found the shooter and arrested him. Without incident, they found the shooter and arrested him. Without incident. They found the shooter and arrested him without incident. They found the shooter and arrested him without incident and arrested him without incident and arrested him without incident. I wrote that right after the Parkland shooting because that was what they reported. It's the same as they reported it after Oklahoma City and Aurora at Charleston. Anytime the shooting, the color of the threat isn't a fear to the people who come to help. I think I'm going to read just one more, just for time's sake. Okay. I'm going to read two more. Forgive me. Go ahead. This one's called To All the White Girls Who. I wrote this recently, it's pending publication. Um, these conversations are hard and everyone's trying to reach out and find their black friends and get some insight in these moments and it's fraught and here's why. To all the white girls who made me feel ashamed of my body, who made me feel confused about how and why I exist in your space, I hope you have lived in fear of this poem. I hope you have been afraid I would name you. 
and shame you. You did me such violence. You didn't mean, you meant, girl, you mean. I mean, whether you meant to or not, you made me a murderer of my tiny black girl joys. They could not gain purchase in your smoothly white space. I killed pieces of myself to survive you. And now you are listening. And you want to learn? You see me. You hear me. So here. I say, resurrect my pieces, gal. Or get your lesson. I do not care who you are now. I cannot stand you to survive this world without some record of your hateful days. It's simple. Your children should know you carelessly hurt black people. And hey, if you raise them right, they might think less of you. But listen, I don't even know how to want to wish you well. All right, this last poem is called A Sustainable Call and Response. Um, and it begins with an excerpt from Van R. Newkirk II's brilliant essay in the Atlantic a few years back called The Great Land Robbery. Um, I'm not going to read it all here right now, the Newkirk excerpt, but please read that article. A Sustainable Call and Response. I'm thinking about food, food movements and that kind of thing. What are you asking us to want? What are you hoping, excuse me, I'm sorry, no. a sustainable call and response? What are you asking us to want? What are you expecting our bodies will remember? Here, let me put it another way. You say, farm to, I say, field hand. You say, fresh produce. I say, strange fruit. You say, back to the basics, back to the land. I say, return. Return unto us our stolen acres. Give us our land back again. How shall we revisit a stolen thing? What harvest invites us home and our hands blood still soaked to every now decorative cloud? Our pastures with a pen stroke turned to someone else's flock? I say no. I say we have left your, not yours, farms for seats at tables. Our ability to 